Welcome back to the OMG MotoGP podcast and this OMG Extra, your little dose of MotoGP throughout the week uh, and you're in the right place if you want to get ready for all things Japan because it is the Japanese Grand Prix this weekend and to talk about it all is myself, Harry Benjamin, and alongside me, the former Grand Prix rider and British champion, Keith Hewen, as always. And there is a lot to get through, Keith, isn't there? Um, Are we ever going to hit Let's start minutes? with... Are we ever going to hit 15 Well, minutes? no, <laughs> I don't think so. I really don't think so. Um, let's start with the calendar. Um, 2024 provisional calendar announced. Uh, what's caught your eye? Uh, Qatar's back at the beginning again. They've obviously sorted the track out now, how they wanted it. There was a delay last year. Obviously, they moved it because of the um, track improvements that are being made. Um, so Qatar is the first round again on the 10th of March. So we start fairly early. Kazakhstan is round nine, still under a provisional banner, though. They've still got to make sure the contract is right, and that's not been done just yet. India is back, of course, round 16. Indonesia, round 17. And we end up with the finale at Valencia again, round 22. So if you thought you were knackered this year, forget it. Next year is going to be even harder. That is, oh, and when is the finale for that? It's in November again, mid-November. British Grand Prix on the 4th of August. That catches my eye. And of course, if um, Kazakhstan falls down or, or any of the others do, we've got Balaton Park about 60 uh, miles outside of Budapest in Hungary as the alternate, if you like, as the, as the spare for next year brand new brand new facility i've not seen it i've never been there um obviously it's uh, homologated for formula one of course it would be wouldn't it um but at the end of the day motor gp has got that as a, as a spare uh, it's a new lakeside venue looks very exciting but i know nothing else about it um but make a note of it um it's worth um paying attention to um i, I mentioned previously as well there's a new Filipino track that looks like it's coming up at some stage in the future. And with Dorna and the rest of MotoGP moving a bit further to the east, you never know where some of these tracks are going to pop up or what ones are going to fall by the wayside. But 22, uh, 22 races next year is going to be an absolute grueling 2024. Yeah, it's a shame that Finland track seems to have just gone bust and, and dropped off the face of the earth. Seen it before, heard it before. I mean, it was ambitious anyway. It's in a part of the world where I would have thought you were up against a lot of things there. Um, mm. not, not least the politics, of course, that, that seem to be changing a certain extent up in the, the, the Nordic Scandinavian areas with their proximity to Russia and so on and so forth. So, you know, all sorts of things, I think, are influencing what goes on in that region at the moment. Uh, too soon to say. Hopefully it will pop up again. I mean, India. We weren't expecting that, were we? Bud International. Um, and it happened so quick. I mean, it, it happened within a year of somebody saying about it when it normally takes sort of two years to lead into these things. Kazakhstan, we should have been there before and we've not. Madalika, um, similarly. Um, so it's it, it can happen fairly quickly. There can be a high turnover. But I think we've reached the zenith of how many... I think we cannot go beyond 22. Personally, I would have said we cannot go beyond 20 from Grand Prix point of view. Mm. Um, but we are now aiming for 22. And I think that's pretty much the last straw on the good old camel's back. Um, one more and, and we're going to have, you know, descent. F1, we're on to 24 next year. So wish us luck on that. Too. Well, you've got, you got um, no money. Alan's... There's more money to start yeah. with. And that situation means more personnel. You know, you can, you can, you can squeeze the pip a bit harder, if you like, if you've got the kind of cash that can double up on personnel and so on and so forth and, and equipment and and all the rest of it. But MotoGP, there is a limit and I and we're there. Mm. Um, well, look, uh, Alan's got in touch um, and this is about Silverstone. He says, hi, guys. Uh, I have never been to a MotoGP uh, Grand Prix despite a good few years following the sport. Uh, with the release of the provisional calendar and seeing the British Grand Prix at the beginning of August, uh, I'd like to alter my abject failure in supporting the sport. Uh, can you advise what you think about the packages on offer? I've looked at MotoGP Premier and it sounds like I'd get to experience all aspects of a Grand Prix. Uh, but would you recommend it? I have no idea where to sit or whether to use a hotel or a tent i feel absolutely lost what would you recommend okay silverstone is a great experience the problem with silverstone is it's bloody windy it's vast so you you want to go as if you're going to climb a mountain because that's what it's like there uh, it, it really is and if the weather is boiling hot you're going to cook and if it's windy and wet you're going to absolutely go rusty it's going to be awful that is silverstone it's an old airfield world war ii airfield what do you expect um it's flat um it's difficult from a spectator's point of view to find a place to feel comfortable about i think bike spectators are different again i keep making this bloody comparison with formula one i hate it really but i have to 
Um, you know, Formula One guys, they pay four times the money to sit in a, a grandstand and watch it and hoot and wave their flag from the grandstand. Whereas bike spectators tend to want to get a bit closer to the action, want to be able to rove around a bit more. One thing I can say about a bike Grand Prix, if it's anything like it was last year, poor old Silverstone, 45,000 people is not enough. So therefore, there is plenty of room. Now, that, for me, affects the atmosphere hugely as well, because it always seems wherever you go, it's empty. Um, 45,000 people is hardly a, you know, you hardly registers as far as Silverstone's turnstiles are concerned. So back to your point, though, where do you go? I would say I'd take two bites of the cherry if I was you. I'd go on Thursday, buy some uh, Day of Champions tickets, which is the recognized MotoGP charity. You get to closer to the stars. They're all obligated to be seen and be out there somewhere whereas on race days and, and the like they're not they're in the paddock and they're running for cover so the chances of catching hold of a superstar on a saturday or sunday are going to be pretty rare even if you could get access to the paddock which you generally can't unless you buy some kind of ridiculous vip ticket somewhere um, which i think you can nowadays um but the day of champions on the thursday if you're not uh, yet embedded in our sport in other words you're, you're not somebody who would do whatever it takes um, to be there early morning to stand outside somebody's you know fence to to try and get hold of your your favourite rider, um, then I would suggest that the, the charity day and you'll feel good about yourself if you part a bit of money for Day of Champions. Um, it's a it's a it's a charity that the Dorna and everyone else has been behind. All the riders are behind it as well, so they all appear on stage. They do an auction at the end of the day, which you know even if you're not buying anything, you can see everybody up on stage. And if you hang around at the back of the stage, you can usually get. Yeah, autographs with riders when they're going back, although they will be in VIP cars. But if you shout loud enough and stand in front of it and prepare to get run over, you might be able to stop them. Um, so Day of Champions will be my recommendation on the Thursday preceding every British Grand Prix. Um, I personally, I prefer personally, and I only live down a road from Silverson, so I always go Fridays because I like free practice and the slightly uh, less congested side of it. But then again, I'm in the privileged bubble aren't i i can wander around wherever i want to wander around um it's a good place to, to you can walk about a lot more i think on a friday as well and take your pick but like i say i think the the biggest issue with silverstone it is it is absolutely vast we're using the wing now don't ask me why i still think that's a folly but anyway um we're using the wing so we're over on the f1 wing um take take your hiking boots and go for a long walk Take a radio. Make sure yeah. you make sure you're tuned in. Don't forget. Actually, it's a good point. Um, funny how I thought of it. Is that um, the TV broadcast is being broadcast on all the monitors? So you're getting the same on the monitors at Silverstone as are out there um, on TNT Sports, for instance. Um, the coverage is out there, and it will be this. It won't. It'll be. Uh, in fact, it's TNT Sports commentary. So you get Hodgie and Emmett and uh, MLAV. Sylvain Gintoli and all those guys. I don't know whether Susie will be back. Probably she will be. Maybe she won't be. Um, but they seem to have the female angle covered now with uh, Rachel Stringer last week. Did a very good job. Natalie Quirk does a very good job. So they've got a good team. And you're getting all of that live at trackside, the same as at home. So why pay for a subscription when you can um, go to Silverstone and get it for free over the over the monitors? Or on your handle, yeah, I'd, I'd, if, you're, if you're plugged in. Of course, you yeah. can get it on your iPad. I'd say if you're also, if you are, you know, privileged and willing to splash some cash, you mentioned MotoGP Premier and we're not sponsored by them yet. But if you want a uh, a weekend where every, you're taken care of, you're looked after and you get access, then that is something you can look into if you've got the cash because it is expensive. And that's what, when Keith says those fancy VIP things, that's what MotoGP Premier allows you to do. And again, if you're a, if you're a hardened outdoor person and love a bit of camping, what the atmosphere with that, then by all means camp. Um, and it, and I'm it, not a camper. And it, I wouldn't do it. And it is a- <laughs> brilliant actually campsite's really really good lots of entertainment don't forget we got some world-renowned bands on on saturday saturday and mm. sunday night actually i mean they, they, they had the killers on last time didn't they i mean they had loads of really really good outs. yeah they were good yeah so i mean there are there are silver to make the effort and spend the money it's just a shame they don't get as much back as they should do really um although that's going to be a much argued point because everybody everybody gets upset at silverson for charging for car parks and stuff like that I think do your homework because you might find yourself with a few expenses that you weren't expecting. Um, unlike if you were expecting to park somewhere decent, then um, you're going to be paying for it, believe me. 
Mm. Well, um, Alan, hopefully that answers some of your questions. Um, and thank you for sending it in. Uh, the email address is omgmotogp at gmail.com for any and all queries. Uh, now, let's get back to focusing a little bit more on this weekend, of course, Japan. Um, and who's riding this weekend, Keith? Actually, well, let's start. Alex Rins. Yeah, back, back after that Tib and Fib break in Magello. Um, he's back, but he hasn't passed his fitness yet. We're shooting this uh, right now. It's just about coming up to quarter to 12 midday UK time on the Thursday, and he'll be doing his um, stress test in in, a, in, a, in an hour or two's time. Um, so we'll, we'll hear later today. He won't be going all the way to Japan if he's not fit, but he still has a fitness test to get by at the moment. So he'll be back on his LCR Yamaha. But the big news for me is Cal Crutchlow is back on the Yamaha, so we'll see. And that's just come off the back of a fairly, you know, reasonable Indian Grand Prix, hasn't it? With the the Indian Oil GP that um, you know we've we've seen the Honda perform pretty well down there. Let's see. And Honda have had, you know, obviously Honda track Mategi, um, so so they'll be looking for a great result there as well, um, as far as the the Honda teams are concerned. So uh, Yamaha looked really really good, finished third last time out too. So Cal Crutchlow, what's he capable of? It might might work for him at Motegi. We'll wait and see. I always think that these wildcard guys, does it show up the standard of what we're seeing regularly every week or does it prove the standard of what we're missing in the Danny Pedrosa, Cal Crutzo et al. are now, are now test riders rather than actual, actual real riders? Um, it confuses me a little bit how they can mix it up with the, with the everyday top-line riders doesn't seem like we've got the aliens that we once had that could never be touched or beaten. Um, Bang Naya keeps trying to take himself out of the equation here. I, I did a little thing earlier on today. He's had five no scores in Grand Prix and one no score, score in print. You can't do that if you're going to win the title. And he knows what it's like because he took a 91-point lead. Uh, he, he ran down a 91-point lead last year to win the world title. Now it's boots on the other foot. His lead is being worn down by Jorge Martin particularly, who's in the best form of his life. Um, so Bang Naya, he knows what it, he knows what both sides of it's like. So he's now got to work hard on stopping the rot with the amount of races we've still got left. Um, yeah. Um, further down, though, in MotoGP, uh, something there. There's some Fanati movements, isn't there, this weekend? Oh yeah, Fanati. Fanati's out again. Uh, that's Moto Two. Obviously, he's replaced by David Amansa, who will, who will be racing for the Snipers team next year anyway. But I mean, that's. That's basically an aside for those that are following the Fanati um, side of things. So um, Almanza will be in Fanati the, saga. Yeah, the Fanati saga. There's always one that goes around him, isn't there? I think the weather is the thing we've got to watch out for at the moment. I mean, the long range forecast that I've been looking at today, you know, it says we're going to have rain all day Saturday and Sunday. So that will make a massive difference to what's going on out on that race track. We've had, you know, awful weather there before. Even weather where the helicopter can't take off, you know, when the when the mist is so low, it's it's the you, know, you can't fly helicopters in the mist when you can, mm-hmm. but it doesn't work too well quite often. Um, so, well, talk talk us through this track then. Go on, give us give us your take on it. It used to be the hardest breaking track on the calendar. If you remember, we ended up with massive great, you know, one off massive great discs, you know, breaks on the on the front of the bikes because they were exploding brakes or getting close to exploding brakes there in in the past. Um, so it is, a, 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 it's got a couple of good stop start corners on it, but it's got that last sequence of down the hill, I think it's turn 11 off the back straight, you come down the hill, it's a real opportunity for braking it before you go under the, the oval circuit because it's twin ring Motegi because it's got a, an IndyCar track that runs around the outside of it as well. You used to have IndyCar races there actually. Um, goes underneath the track and then you come up to Victory Corner where it's a real left-right flip-flop onto the front straight and it's a massively long straight before you get to the finish line. So the likes of Moto3 can be won on the straight, effectively, if you've, if you've popped a nice little um, slipstream out of, out of order. Moto2, probably not so much. As you get more in horsepower, you get less, the you know, slipstream has a slightly less effect. Um, but as far as, we've had some absolute classic battles there. You know, De Vizioso versus Marquez. When we get to our um, uh, our predictions, which I've actually written down this week, because normally it just comes straight out of my head. Ooh. I've put Marquez in. Um, for for a, a podium this weekend because he just he always produces the magic in front of the Honda hierarchy at Motegi. You know he and Danny Pedrosa, the little samurai. Uh, you know they always seem to come up with something Honda at this particular racetrack. And of course, if you ever have the pleasure of going there, which you you know Japan is, it's a bit intoxicating, isn't it? Japan, you you kind of want to go to Japan. You've just come away from there, but I bet you didn't have enough time to really do what you would have wanted to do. I mean, one day in Tokyo is never going to be enough. 
Um, Susie Perry, I mentioned her earlier on. I mean, Susie Perry loves Japan. She spent a lot of time out there in her youth, um, and, and she has a real love affair with Japan, and I can understand why. For me, it doesn't really do it. Um, I kind of like the quirkiness of it all. The countryside is beautiful. Um, the, the trip up to Motegi is, is slightly awkward. Um, but if you want to go on a fast train or a well-organized, uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be, tour, then Japan's your place. Um, but it's the Honda Museum for me that does it. And if you've got Julian Ryder, if you see him hanging around loitering anywhere, then make sure you take Julian with you because he's like the mine of all useless knowledge that um, the bit you thought he knew, um, Julian will fill in the bit that he didn't. And, uh, and, and it's always quite mm -hmm. interesting. So the, the museum is a must-do at Motegi uh, for me over and above everything. Don't stay in the hotel at the track if you're thinking about splashing out of the hotel at the track. It's like, um, uh, well, I always think of the song Hotel California. You know, you, you stab it with your steely knives, but you still can't kill the, the beast or meat or whatever it is because <laughs> it, it's the worst place to stay. I've never come across a more soulless hotel in my entire life as, as, the, as the, the one. And there is nothing to do there at all. There is zero to do there. So if, if you like your And all company, Japanese might... hotel rooms are tiny. Well, some are. Do you know what? We stay in Mito. I mean, you will have seen, if you follow my timeline on Twitter, you'll have seen me always on about the Drunken Duck down in Mito, which is which is, a, is an Australian bar, which is an absolute riot. And, and we all used to hang out there, you know, again, talking bloody BT sport, Oji with his shirt off, completely out of control and dribbling all over the place. It was always quite good fun to watch. Um so it's kind of and and Jamie the the guy who owns he owns two drunken ducks in in, in Japan but the one in Mito is uh, is the one that we all hang out at. And, and most of the riders come there and of course a lot of the locals come there I think just to look at the idiots that look like us that are there making fools of ourselves so um, <laughs> and the menu's good and the beer's cold so that's quite good so you've got to go to the drunken duck in Mito definitely. Yeah, I mean, food's amazing in Japan. I could have had another week. Um, I, I should have had another week, really, if I'd planned it better. Uh, I should have done. I should have got myself a MotoGP pass somehow and then d d spent, you know, a couple more days in Tokyo and then made my way to, to Motegi. That would have been perfect. Well, considering you were uh, there for hope, free next to the Formula year. 1, I would have said it definitely was. Someone else was paying your ticket for your for your flights and stuff. And I mean, I've, I always try to do that as well socially. You tight git. <laughs> yeah i know i know I, I, i'm not getting into it now uh, <laughs> um, uh look, let's uh let's have a look at uh, uh before we come to our predictions the form book for this weekend we mentioned peko and how you know he needs he needs he needs to finish he's fast we know that he can win but he needs to finish now because that fall the points uh, uh nothing between him and, and jorge martin who is on a bit of a run of things but Zeki's right there as well they're both on a mission how do you see who do you think's got got the stronger form coming into this weekend out of out of the title contenders bang Naya does make unforced errors he did in his early you know uh, early on uh, last year the year before um he makes the occasional unforced error and uh, you, you can't have six effectively no finishes in a championship year uh it's just that it's his form when he stays on he's so brilliant and that's why he's he's still what 13 points in the lead 13 points that's all now um that's mm. that's just you know well if, if he doesn't finish in the first sprint race. He'll be and somebody and, and Martin wins it. He'll be just one point away. So it's a critical tie for Bangnaya. Weather comes to play. Fitness comes to play. Um, you know, and we'll see. I've gone in for the sprint race uh, for the uh, big race. I think now. By the time he settles down for Sunday, I, I just I think that he will be back on it. I, I, you can't dismiss someone of his talent, his quality. You know, but Jorge Martin is riding the crest of a wave at the moment, and, and yeah. We saw it last year when when Benyaya closed down Quattararo. There's nothing Quattararo could do. As soon as you start thinking about, oh, I better not push the front end, you know, by the finest of margin, you will not win a race. Nowadays, it's about mm. overextending yourself at every single corner, every single breaking point. Otherwise, you're not going to win a race because they're all so close. And Jorge well, Martin, yeah, he's chasing down the, you know, like I think Benyaya has said it. Now I'm the prey, and he actually is. Because Martin is on his best form ever, um, and there is nothing going to stop him at this particular point. I've always said winning. The, <laughs> I always look at world champions over over a three year period. Winning that first world championship, that's what everybody is. You know, you're on a high. You, you know, to bang in that first world championship, um, it's then how you retain it. Retaining it is the hard bit. I always think the superstars in our sport are the ones that are multiple world champions that that managed to retain it the second, the third year. I think by the time you get to the third year, 
you can really tell just how uh, what quality you've got as, as a rider. I mean, winning one, yeah, fantastic. You're in a in rarefied air when it comes to winning a world title in any one of the classes, really, particularly MotoGP though. Um, but then a second and third title or more in the case of some um, is a bit special. Let's see what happens. Mm. Um, Jorge Martin could be world champion this year on a satellite bike. There are better men than me that could work that stay out, but that ain't been done for a while. But Zeki behind him, you know, another satellite bike. You know, this is this is the the era of uh, equality in MotoGP for me. Well, now wouldn't that be something to write home about if Martin or Bezeki was to end up champion? Let's end, shall we, before we come to our predictions. A uh, question from Matt. Uh, so good to have you back. Um, considering Yamaha's fall from grace has been so rapid, unlike their race pace this season, how much of this is really just the aftermath of Yamaha having been in somewhat of a development heaven for such a long time, with the likes of Valentino and Jeremy Burgess being the major contributors? Have they not been agile enough to reform around someone new like Fabio? Or are are we seeing a greater example of a championship winning rider not being able to develop a bike because of a lack of experience, foresight or being too emotive? Well, there's several answers on that one, isn't there? I think that you've only got to look at it like a Mark Marquez. I mean, most people say that he can't develop a motorbike, um, but he knows how to go bloody fast on one that he can't develop. That's for certain. When it comes to Yamaha, I, I just think that the Japanese in as a whole, have fallen behind the times. I mean, Suzuki stepped off the off the boat fairly swiftly when they saw what was coming. They were quite smart when you look back at it and, and looking at the amount of money it was going to cost them to stay in the game with what was a cross-frame, you know, four-cylinder bike. Um, Yamaha, for me, have never made enough of an investment into the future, rider-wise or bike-wise. They've always had too few bikes on the track. They never seem to have that 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 uh, ladder of talent Um to pull from look at KTM they've got you know they've got a situation where they've got riders in stock you know Hanuk another one off the shelf and 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 quite fast guys that are that are in, are in the track the, the ladder to to the top end to the factory team same with Ducati Ducati eight bikes on the grid their their commitment financially is huge um, Yamaha's you know the bookwork is not open to us but you can only guess that they 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 look to me to be doing it in the in the most economical way that is possible. Honda have fallen behind. The engineering um, lead-in time that you need to get engineering sorted and, and if you're going to change engineering um, takes months and months and months and months and that's before you even get to testing it and it might not work. You know, there's, there's no substitute for data. There's no substitute for being able to make those changes as and when they come up and having enough people to ride them of quality. Uh, Ducati have got that covered. The Europeans have got that covered. Aprilia seem to have that fairly well covered now as well. So I think that Yamaha have fallen behind the times and it's their own fault, is my idea. Okay. All right then. Prediction time. Who have you got? Um, Sprint. No, Sprint, Martin Bez and uh, Mar Marquez. So that's my um, okay. My top three Martin for that. Bez. What have you got? Right. I've got? I've got Binder, Martin... Bez. Miller, because Miller apparently is getting a new frame this weekend, a uh, carbon fiber chassis. So I don't know if that might suddenly make him really, really fast. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's a car way of thinking. I think you're you're in you're in car mode there a little bit. Uh, new chassis, it will it'll, it'll fix everything. Um, it's a bit more cerebral, I think, in bikes. In that, that Miller at the moment is just in a little dip. I think that you, it could mm. be this weekend, and it could be that could be the confidence boost he needs. He's ah, oh, they're giving me the new kit, and it feels good, and I'm gonna. And particularly if it is if the weather is iffy, you can never discount the likes of, of Miller. So you might well be on the money. Binder definitely is a good shout. Um, definitely a good shout. You know, I keep I keep. Why do I keep going with Zarco all the time? I'm not going to go with Zarco this weekend, which will mean that the weather will be bang on for him, and he'll be an absolute bloody <laughs> fixture in the he'll top. Finally, three. get a race win. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's called Sod's Law, and I'm I'm playing to it. In the in the Grand Prix race on Sunday, I've gone Bang Naya, Martin, and Bezeki. Um, that's what I got for my top three, but the weather is going to make. Oh, uh, you know, Go you know what? I'm not. We've got exactly the same, have we? <laughs> I ha and I haven't. I haven't written that out. I've gone Pecco, Martin, Bezeki. Oh well, there you go. Well, we're, the Grand Prix. I'd say great minds think alike, but clearly that is not the case uh, today. <laughs> um, oh dear. So it, I mean, it's it. Uh, the weather will make a massive difference, and some, uh, someone like Zarco could be right in there. You know, it's it's uh, it, he's got the right bike. He just seems to be a bit below par. 
you know, and the same thing with Miller. Miller's just a fraction below par at the moment. But I, I alluded to it last time we talked about it. You know, fresh baby. He's been backwards and forwards to Australia a little bit more than he might might would have been. His eye's been taken very slightly off the ball. He'd argue like the opposite with that. I'm fairly sure any rider would. Um, but there are things that spin around in your head. You know, and we're into the deep, dirty game now, aren't we? This this is it where we go to lots of tracks a long way away from home, and this is this is where you dig in and you work hard from here on in. Not that they haven't already, but. It's going to be a tough finale to the season. Anything could happen, and I love that. Yeah, cannot wait. And uh, we go racing once more this weekend in Japan. So we'll be straight back afterwards to look back at it all. In the meantime, though, you can leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and we'll see you next week to look back at it all, as I say. And then we'll be here for another extra dose. But actually, before we go, Keith, we should just give a little teaser, shouldn't we, about something we've got coming up over the next couple of weeks. Foggy down the pub. Carl Fogarty um, and I went to the Stirrup Cup in Barton Seagrave uh, this week uh, and entertained uh, a very small uh, but animated and uh, friendly audience. Um, and uh, we're going to put it out for you. So you can you can catch up with a two-parter coming up in the next week or so. Um, it's a freebie. Enjoy it on OMG and uh, hopefully uh, you'll you'll enjoy it. And many more to come, I think. We're, we've been looking at, at, at different things to come in the, in the future. Um, but the first of our down the pub interviews will be with Carl Fogarty. Um, it was very, very interesting on several fronts. I'm not going to put any spoilers out there for the moment because I've not even seen the edit yet. Um, but I, I, Carl is he's much more complex than, than even I had thought, and I've known him since he was a boy. So um, look forward to that. Yeah, so keep abreast on uh, the OMG MotoGP socials uh, to find out when that will be available for your viewing and listening pleasure. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll bid you goodbye for now. My thanks to Keith, my thanks to me, and my thanks to you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.